Today's conversation is about education, which is really about what we do at the Council on World Affairs. It's an important topic and one that's constantly changing, so we want to talk today about some of the trends um, on where education is going, and in particular, why does it matter for us to have global competence, global skills, global understanding in order to succeed, not just in education, but beyond in our careers uh, and, and in college if we're, if we're students. Um, the Global Scholars Diploma Program, in short, is a high school credential that a student could earn over three years that then goes on their transcripts as a way to show employers and or colleges that this student has global skills and is able to thrive in a, in a global context. Let me show a video um, and let you chew and you can clank all you want, get it over with because you got a four minute video um, and then after that we'll, we'll proceed right into our discussion. So. If we can roll the video, please. We're looking for people with language skills, country knowledge, uh, people that can help us explain the cultures that we're doing business in and with. The Global Scholars Diploma really is the gateway to the experiences, the knowledge, the skills that students need to survive and really thrive in the world that they're entering, whether they're going directly into college or directly into a career. from parents that they want these opportunities for their students beyond um, what we provide for them as far as classroom experiences and the students love it. You look at our students and the, and the field trip opportunities that they take place. They're going to Honda uh, up in Marysville, in the Capital University, they're going to Ohio State, they're going all over the city to interact with professionals and, and community leaders. Um, as well as peers. I came from Senegal, West Africa. But Africa is a whole continent with 54 countries. So it's really hard to say Africa is this or that because there's so many different things. People need to look at culture and religion and know the difference and where one start and where one ends. This morning when we were coming down here, they're like, what are we doing today? I hope the West Muskingum kids are there. And in telling them that they're going to listen to all of these um, speakers from different countries, the kids were so fascinated by like, where are they from? What are they gonna tell us? And they just come back and the bus is all chatter on the way home about everything that they learned in such a small amount of time. It's a great um, cultural exchange um, that's occurring between the students, but it's a great learning experience. A lot of business in different parts of the world is based on culture. How do you build your relationships? How do you build your contacts? It all depends upon the culture first. Educate and develop people who are voters, consumers, citizens of the 21st century that they have these competencies and have these experiences and understand that you know, the world's not just Ohio, it's not just the United States, it's, it's a pretty significant place. In addition to just being the principal at the building, I'm, I'm a father. You know, I've got, I've got two sons. The education it provides, the experiences it provides. I look at that for the high school students and I think it makes a lot of sense. But then closer to home, I look at it and I think for my own kids, when I want them to have this experience, it, it's really a resounding yes. Uh, there will also be people who will travel here from different cultures and it's good to learn about them, especially if you're going to work with them or be in a community with them. If you can understand another country's perspective on things, you can relate to them and help them solve problems too. The next generation should pretty much set aims and goals for what they want to achieve, and they should think about how to help others. The first time I went to Honda, Honda company, really changed me a lot. And the first person I met was the vice president of Honda. I was really happy, and he gave me some advice. It changed me a lot and it gives me motivation to do everything I want. And get the goals and go for the goals. Don't procrastinate. It's like if you want to do something, do it. Don't just like wait for someone else to do it. I've always wanted to um, work with people from 
other cultures and other areas in the world just to see like their perspectives. It's just nice to meet other people that care about what's going on in the world. Not just to understand what the problem is, but it really means to take initiative. The Global Scholars Diploma is anchored in rigorous academic research from Harvard, but guided by practical application of global competence. It's applying what students are learning in the classroom so that they can have a real world experience. The Global Scholars Diploma, and it's something now that we've been doing for three years, and next year we're um, doubling. So uh, if you want your high school, or you think another high school you know should join, uh, Brad's, Brad Goshi's in the dark. He's, he probably did this because when you see the growth slide, he's the guy that's going to have to do it. So you talk, go ahead and talk to him. You can see it on the screen. This is what we're estimating for next year, the, the far, the far um, column. Um, the demand for understanding global competence and being able to be um, interactive with people from different and diverse cultures is a huge discussion. It's my pleasure to introduce to you today uh, the executive director of the Martha Holden Jennings Foundation, an organization that really was uh, at the forefront in innovating global competence in Ohio. And if you hear about anything global in Ohio, as well as a lot of other stuff, it's usually because the Martha Holden Jennings Foundation is supporting it. Um, more importantly than that, though, is the leadership in Dan Keenan, a former superintendent himself. This is someone that gets education, gets what schools have to deal with every day, and is working hard to connect those hardworking schools with funds to make their visions a reality. In 2013, he was named Ohio Superintendent of the Year by the Buckeye Association of School Administrators. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the podium, Dan Keenan. Thank you, Patrick. <clears throat> Current trends in education aim to develop the magnitude of skills that learners will need to thrive in a globally oriented society. Why is experiential learning important and what role does it play in student preparedness? How is technology and content delivery changing to promote and integrate key skills like critical thinking, collaboration, and creativity? What are other countries' education systems doing well, and how can we learn from them? And what role do employers and the broader community play in enriching student experiences and ensuring educational successes? The Martha Holden Jennings Foundation is thrilled to have such a forward-thinking and action-oriented partner as a Columbus Council on World Affairs to support deep learning for Ohio's public school students. It becomes increasingly clear that preparing students adequately for their future means preparing them to succeed in a global context and making sure all students have access to and flourish under a world-class education. I'm honored to introduce today's distinguished panel speakers, Kate Berseth, Deb Delisle, and Christine Willig. Kate uh, Berseth is Executive Vice President, North America for EF Education First. As EVP, Kate oversees product innovation, strategic partnership development, and marketing functions for EF's educational travel products. Kate is primarily responsible for understanding evolutionary and revolutionary trends in education space and making recommendations for how EF should adjust its operation to respond to these trends while bringing continual improvement to its product offering. She also identifies, establishes, and maintains EF strategic relationships with a variety of stakeholders in education, travel, and corporate landscapes. <clears throat> Prior to joining EF in 2000, Kate worked in fundraising as well as nonprofit and political consulting. She served in a variety of capacities for several national political campaigns before co-founding ROI Solutions, a database management services provider for progressive nonprofit organizations. Please help me welcome Kate. <clears throat> Deb Delisle is the Executive Director and CEO of the Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development, ASCD. ASCD is a global community of educators dedicated to excellence in learning, teaching, and leading. Deb's 40-year career in education during her 40, year in 40 years in education, she served as a teacher. 
long. 40, I did say 40, right? <laughs> She's served as a teacher, a gifted education specialist, curriculum director, elementary principal, district associate superintendent, superintendent, Ohio's state superintendent, and university instructor. She was nominated as the U.S. Assistant Secretary of Elementary and Secondary Education by President Obama in January of 2012 and served in that position until 2015. From 2008 to 2011, uh, Deb served as Ohio's 35th State Superintendent of Public Instruction and from 2003 to 2008 was the Superintendent of the Cleveland Heights University Heights City School District here in Ohio. Please welcome Deb Doyle. Christine Willig serves as superintendent of the McGraw-Hill Education. <laughs> it's great. I've never been called a superintendent before. Did I say superintendent? <laughs> President. <laughs> it's like a notch above superintendent, <laughs> right? <laughs> Sorry to promote you. I, I love it. <laughs> McGraw-Hill's K-12, and it's written right here for me, K-12 group. <laughs> Previously, she served as K-12 senior vice president of product leading uh, of product, leading in all product development and managing the portfolio of pre-K through 12 curriculum and instructional materials. Christine joined McGraw-Hill Education in 2011 as a K-12 group senior vice president of STEM. It's also assistant superintendent position <laughs> in a role when she headed up product development and marketing for all STEM disciplines. Prior to joining McGraw-Hill Education, Chris serves a pres served as president and chief executive officer of Math Solutions the leading provider of mathematics teacher professional development in the United States. In her time with Math Solutions, she improved the technology offer offerings from the company to drive the highest quality professional support in mathematics with partner states, districts, and schools. She led Math Solutions through a successful acquisition to Scholastic in 2010. Please welcome Christine. Ladies and gentlemen, I will hand this back over to Patrick. Thank you very much. Um, let's just start off so to give people a context. You know, part of what we want to do is bring in people from different parts of education because we all know it's everyone's responsibility to educate a child, not just the schools. Um, so we have some representation from a variety of organizations. I just ask each person from Kate, and we'll move down. What does your organization basically do? An like sort of your elevator speech? Great. So um, uh, again, I'm Kate Verseth from EF Education First. Um, we are one of the largest global education companies in the world. And our mission is opening the world through education. And we do that through language learning, cultural exchange programs. And many of you know us through our educational travel programs. So lots of experiential learning opportunities for uh, kids at all phases of their education. Big, little? How? Oh, we're privately held. Very hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I come from the opposite side of the public sector. It's the very, we're a family held company, actually. We were founded by one man 50 years ago, and, it, and in rare form, I think, these days, he still very much owns 100% of it and manages the day to day, and I work for one of his sons. Um, although we have 40,000 employees around the world, uh, about 400 offices and schools in 54 countries. And they're always hiring. And we're always hiring, so, yes. Uh, Deb, Thanks tell us so about ASCD. Um, first, thank you so much for including me on this panel, and I, I really want to thank so many friends with whom I've worked over the course of my 30 years in, in Ohio. It's great to come back home. Um, 08. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I did that once at the Department of Ed, and people were looking at me like, what? What are you doing? <laughs> that, I was going to say that, that's because they couldn't spell Ohio, but I won't. That's really <laughs> kind of rude of me to say. Anyway, so I'm currently at ASCD. I um, have been there since July. And outside of teachers' organizations and unions, we are the largest educational organization in the world. We have 130,000 members across 158 countries. We have affiliates of ASCD in every single state. Um, and most recently at our annual conference, we drew over 8,000 people from 59 countries and every single state. So our primary work is focused on providing um, ed every educator at every realm of their, uh, of their role um, any product and services that will help them to be better at their role. So our motto is learn, teach, and lead, and we focus extensively whether we publish books, we provide professional learning, that's our, our biggest um, 
offering and we have a journal educational leadership or called EL which is always receiving high honors and we reach about 500,000 um, members and non-members online through our digital services and products and publications every single month. Um, so we have pretty much broad expansion. And our interest in um, global work is, is obviously because we have international members, but most, mostly that we're really focusing in on enhancing learning and leading for every single educator in, in the country, not only that, but also in the world. And we sponsor international summits and global educator um, forums. Um, so keenly interested in this topic. And we are this year throwing open our doors to partner with as many organizations that are mutually beneficial. So we've already been in, in contact um, with Patrick about um, dealing with a, a partnership and making it effective. So really happy to be here and talk about this topic, which I think is absolutely so critical. Thank you. Thank you. Chris? Yes, I'm Christine Willig. I'm the president of K-12 for McGraw-Hill Education. I, too, want to say um, it is an honor to be here. I love being with educators, and I love that bridge between business and education because I think there's nothing more important or vital to drive our economy and to drive our collective success as both a country and a world through that lens of education. Um, who is McGraw-Hill? McGraw-Hill Education is a learning science company who is dedicated to unlocking the full potential of each learner. Yes, that's our mission statement. Unlocking the full potential of each learner. We do that pro by providing robust curriculum, instructional resources, platforms, and formative assessment in which, and adaptive technologies to drive learning forward. We're focused on engaging effective, uh, efficacy-based, easy-to-use solutions that help teachers teach and help kids learn. In, uh, in terms of our size, um, we recently filed our S1, and anyone who knows what that is, they can go look it all up. But we have about uh, 5,000 employees worldwide. Um, while I'm responsible for our pre-K-12 activities in um, the United States, we have a huge higher ed division, um, a huge international division with offices all over the world. Um, but the wonderful thing about this effort um, is that we have about 1,000 employees in the Columbus area um, and 5,000 employees total. I live here in Columbus, and um, we believe Ohio is the heart of it all, all right. <laughs> even though I did not go to Ohio State. You get the honorary, uh, honorary whatever. I went um. to Oberlin, I just like to say. So I'm going to. So, all you. right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. And it's great to have you in the community. I think sometimes we forget that there's great resources within our own uh, short drive. Uh, let's just start, Kate. Maybe I could start with you thinking about um, at least trends first in your business in terms of student global travel. Um, is it the same trip that maybe your parents took 20 years ago? Or <laughs> I took, I mean. Um, sure, I I, I'd be happy yeah. to talk about trends. And, and I want to talk about international travel, but also domestic travel, because I think yeah. it's all about experiential learning in whatever community is outside of your classroom. And I think, you know, even 10 years ago, it was very much a passive experience. And so you were looking at, you were sightseeing, right? You're sitting on a bus and you're looking at the Eiffel Tower or you're looking at the State House or whatever. Um, and now what we hear from schools, and for those of you who know me, I spent um, about three years visiting a ton of schools in Ohio as our sort of pilot to understand um, how we should be innovating on our programs. And so, um, you know, I've, I've tried to explain to everyone in my office in Cambridge that Ohio is America's test kitchen. They actually all thought I had a boyfriend in Ohio, and that's why I was traveling. Every that wasn't true. Um, <laughs> um, but, but very much about more immersive learning and more participation and more connection um, and engagement with the cultures that you're visiting. Um, and so our programs, you know, we've built a lot more programs within service learning. We've built more programs in language immersion, so immersing yourself in the culture and learning the language of that culture. Um, we've built uh, these uh, Global Student Leader Summits where students are coming together 
around a relevant topic in a destination related to that topic and doing real problem solving around that. So I would say the trend is immersive, experiential, and relevant, right? Kids also want to be talking about things that they feel passionate about and that they feel like are relevant, relevant for their futures. And so we've really tried to innovate on our programs to make them all of those things. Thank you. And I just asked Deb, maybe from the educator's perspective, um, does some of this resonate uh, in terms of, of more active learning, more integration, and more moving from passive to more dynamic? And then if it's relevant, uh, the global competence piece, how, how does that play into this trend that we're seeing? Yeah. I, I think you'd see the trend from all of us in using one word, which is relevance. Um, so what I've seen across the country, particularly in my prior role when I got to travel um, to almost every state to visit school districts, is that uh, kids are, not just kids are hungry, but teachers are hungry to make a difference in the lives of their students, and you do that through relevance, right? So a, a huge trend towards personalized learning, experiential learning, problem-based learning, whatever you want. And even in, um, with the most challenged populations and the most vulnerable of our kids, what I've seen is that when learning becomes relevant for them and they can make those connections, whether directly to their community or some of them just traveling, and I appreciate your focus on domestic travel as well, some of these kids haven't even been out of their own county. So for them to understand that there's a world outside of that classroom wall, uh, those classroom walls is really vital, and I've seen a, a big push for that. What I've seen is sort of on the negative side that I really worry about a lot is that there's still this um, almost acceptance of mediocrity across our country when it comes to the educational experiences that we offer to kids. And when I used to go into schools, and I still do, um, I would always ask myself one question, which is, is this school good enough for my own kid? And what I'm still seeing very dishearteningly so is that we allow certain schools to be okay for other people's kids and not for our own. So I'm feeling like this lack of urgency on the part of creating these systems for all kids um, actually denigrates what should be our primary purpose in education, which is to give hope to every single kid, right? And so this whole movement towards personalized learning, and I think we have a great opportunity right now with the recent passage of ESSA, I think we have a great opportunity from the ground up to really push hard on how do we define student success. Um, at ASCD, which has been around since 1943, for the last 10 years, we've been working on this framework around whole child, and it's when that you can't just focus on what standards you teach kids, but you have to focus on creating environments in which kids are, feel safe and they have an advocate and they're challenged and they're healthy kids. And so these five tenants on the whole child have really surfaced up in great amounts of interest, primarily from international countries, mm -hmm. people looking to move away from this over-reliance on standardized tests. And now with the opt-out movement last year across the country, we're now having school districts come to us and say, how can we ensure that our kids, that we're teaching to the whole child and that we're offering opportunities for kids to feel you know, safe and healthy mm -hmm. and challenged, et cetera. So I see this big movement happening, but my concern is that it's happening in pockets. And somehow we're not able as a country to grapple with that and figure out how do we scale this whole movement up so that every child gets the best education possible, one that we would want for our own kids. Wow. Sounds good. You may get a, get a call from uh, the Trump campaign to be the, or the Clinton campaign, either one, that's, <laughs> or the Sanders campaign. <laughs> <laughs> or the, uh, You're going to get yourself into trouble. I'm going I, deeper and deeper. Yeah. Yeah. Just stop, Patrick. Just stop. Just yeah. stop. So, <laughs> I can guarantee I won't get one from the Kasich campaign. So. <laughs> Inside well, joke. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the, I wanted to talk too about. Oh, please don't tweet that out. <laughs> I don't know what we're talking about. I'm just, here, I'm just trying to moderate an, an informed discussion. Um, John, you got to help me. You got me. <laughs> Chris, Christine, I was thinking about technology, and you've got a lot of background in in that, even before McGraw Hill, because um, you know I think the average person who's not informed in, on where McGraw-Hill has come, thinks about a big old textbook, um, you know, <laughs> lugging it around. How, what's the role of technology in learning? And how do you see it, how do you see it changing? That's an enormous question. That we but it's could, easier than that, the one yeah. I had here, right? Well, you know, I, I, think, I think a way to approach the answer to that question 
is, is definitely around the, what, what, what um, has already been brought up here. We're looking for equity and we're looking for excellence. And what is the purpose of school? The purpose of school is not for these many people to have jobs, for the buses to run on time. The, the, the purpose of school is student outcomes. And, and how all the various variables participate in creating student outcome is, is what is really shifting and changing. And we, when, we, when we think about um, the two big broad swipes of education, English language arts and mathematics, they have two distinct sets of goals. So with English language arts, people, we, we have an expectation that a student outcome is being able to read. Literacy is a gateway. If no matter how much we evolve into a world of video, literacy will have a really critical, vital role. And one of the outcomes as you move up the curriculum, and there's a lot of high school people here, what, when you talk to a high school English teacher, what they really want is their students to be able to craft argument and understand point of view. And those are beautiful things that happen in a great experiential program, much better than in a lecture-based program. Mm -hmm. Now we flip that over to mathematics. So why study math? How many have ever heard a child say, why do I have to learn this? Relevance. The goal of mathematics is reasoning with numbers. That's it. The ab ability to, again, craft argument, understand an experience through the power of numbers. It's incredible when their eyes open up to the power of reasoning with numbers. So when you ask about educational technology, I think um, we've, we've grown into a world where, where we think math is computation and, and reading is something around phonemic awareness and, and sounding words out loud. The goal really is to create these global citizens who can craft arguments and can reason with numbers. So when it comes to educational technology, and I can talk later about adaptive, in a world that's gotten as small as ours has, and with the goal of experience, project-based learning, rich problem tasks, a lot of phrases that some of you in the room have heard, we, are, um, we, we want the technology to take care of what I'll call the grunty bits. You don't need a teacher to grill kids on their times tables. Is it good for them to understand the relationship between addition and multiplication? Absolutely. Is it important for them to know their times tables? I'd say probably most of the people in this room would agree. However, the goal ultimately is for them to reason with numbers. So let the technology do what the technology can do. There's a lot of apps out there that can do a lot of the grunty bits. And a lot of the really cool work that McGraw-Hill Education is doing around educational technology is to set that platform so that these richer experiences can have meaning while also driving rigor. And there is a delicate balance there um, of, of teachers feeling tremendous pressure around um, getting to these skill sets that are called for in higher level standards. I won't say whose standards, any kind of standard, right? So there's a role of the, that the technology can help move through some of these pieces faster so that teachers can take us into a broader world and it's a very exciting time with respect to that. So maybe too long-winded, but do you, do you understand what I'm Does saying? Anyone here want to comment or add to that? I mean, I, when you said math is about reasoning with numbers, I was thinking about global, and, and global isn't you know, sort of where you go or what you see. It's a mindset, mm -hmm. right? And so something that we're, we're, sort of, we're teaching in schools is not the right answer, it's how to think and how to be open. Exactly. Um, and that exactly. I think is a it's it's a shift, and I see that as as you know a shift that's happening in different ways in in, in schools. But I also 
am responsible for, um, for recruitment and, and people and staff development in North America for us, which is about 2,500 people. So we hire tons of young people right out of college. Um, I see somebody's father right there. We hired, we hired his daughter. Um, sorry, That's Jerry. why he's at the lunch. <laughs> um, but, you know, we're not looking for students who have the right answer. We're looking for students who have learned how to think and, and are, you know, have, have learned how to make mistakes and have learned how to be open. And so our job as educators, how do we, how do we teach that in school? Um, and I don't have all the right answers for that, but, but it seems like we have to first start with a question of what are, what are the student outcomes? Right. Um, and then how are we building an education what, system that gets to those? What is it that you, so why do you look for that? What, what ultimately do you need as an employer um, that satisfies that? What, they have to be able to think. Why? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you why. We, I mean, for us, it's about, um, it's about being innovative, and it's about thinking about the future, and it's about creative problem solving. It's not about learning how we do things today and how to carry that through, right? So we always want people who are going to help us understand how to do things better. So I don't want to put someone in an operational role who's just going to do what the person did before them. I want to put someone in that operational role who's going to question what was happening before, think about the future, um, and, and do something different. You know, it, it seems ahead, to me, uh, yeah, I, I want to just push a little bit on the technology thing, because I, not push in a negative way, but deepen it a little <laughs> bit, I should have said, um, because I think it, it should force us to ask the, the deeper question about not just what role technology plays and, and attach it to student outcomes, but how does that transition the role of the, of the teacher? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I, I think that's a huge piece that we have. We struggle with that all the time. You know, um, our, some of our product developers will say, we're just going to offer courses online. Well, that may be great, but have we really thought about adults as learners, right? And so even human capital systems in school districts across the country don't do this really great job of thinking through OK, I want to hire the best math teacher possible, right? So how do you blend that with what we know business wants? And how do we push on uh, teacher training institutions so that those graduates come out teaching in a different kind of way? And it struck I was just writing a blog the other day, and it struck me how um, it was all on the physical environments in which kids learn. And it struck me how nobody in this room would argue that we shouldn't have kids collaborating. But then for the majority of times, especially at the secondary level, I walk into schools, and it doesn't matter if the school is new or old, we still have desks and rows of desks, and sometimes the desks are small for our kids. And I'm like, well, isn't that contradictory? And we're being so hypocritical to say we support this, and that's one of our values, but then we don't create the environment in which kids can learn. Or you, know, you get kids engaged in technology in a really robust kind of way, and then the bell rings, <coughs> and they have to shut down and then move to the next class. Or the whole, they move as a group. Every kid, as opposed to being a competency-based system. So I think we haven't really come to grapple with what does this mean truly, and how do, how do we impact that, the teacher training institutions or principal in licensing programs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I think we've got to come to terms with that. And it really pushes hard on this global engagement. Um, I feel like, I know this is a little bit winded, but I'm on this one-woman crusade right now, so hopefully other people jump on my bandwagon of, of this whole notion of redefining student success. I've been playing around with this a lot, and I've gone out to superintendents, and I'll ask them to pull out their mission statement from their schools. And no mission statement says, our kids are going to be great textbook page turners. Or they don't say, we're going to get great scores in ELA. What they talk about is civic mindedness and lifelong learning. But they don't report out on that, so they don't tell their community they value that. They go on, they tell their scores, how they did on the state report card, where they rank nationally. And I'm like, we're in this really strange space of speaking out of both sides of our mouth about what's really important. So I want people to really redefine student success based on what their community has decided is the mission of their school district, and then use technologies effectively as a tool and to provide opportunities for kids to think and learn outside of those classroom walls. Uh, good. Did you, uh, no, um, go ahead. So as an employer, yep. so switch my hat, yes. right? So as an employer, um, we uh, train, uh, our, our sales force was recently trained on a whole philosophy of learn or die. 
the only sustainable competitive advantage of any business, whether it's in Ohio or in Calcutta, is the ability to learn quickly, yeah. adapt, learn, grow. So um, learn or die, I have some McGraw-Hill people, we're master problem solvers. I want master problem solvers. We're solving problems for our customers every day, whether it's helping that child read or, um, or whether it's uh, because something didn't come to them from the warehouse. But the ability for any employee to have a broader perspective and even better, a, a multicultural perspective, which is tied to the work um, that we're celebrating here today, that kind of mindset is the kind of employee we want at McGraw-Hill Education, when, whether you're here in Columbus, Seattle, Boston, Santa Monica, New York, um, all the places where we have offices around the United States. We, so. Speaking of employers, we work a lot with some of our large employers here. Um, you see some here like L Brands and Abbott and Cardinal and Mattel. And we, we listen to what are the needs and um, problem solving, critical thinking. It's also collaboration. Uh, and I think about some of the school environments where you're in a desk mm -hmm. and you're really not working together. And there aren't many work environments where that's been true. Um, and then specifically around collaboration is collaborating and working together in multicultural teams. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I talk to so many people here and anywhere, and a lot of time spent on phone calls with teams that are in Dubai, Denver, Columbus, right. mm -hmm. um, you know, Brasilia, wherever. And so understanding the dynamics of if your uh, Asian counterpart, your Brazilian counterpart, there's different ways to communicate. How do you, how do you work through that? We hear that a lot with, with the employers. So, but I'm also hearing it from local, like teachers. We've got multiple mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. countries represented within our own classroom. Absolutely. So how do, how do I, as an educator, best uh, understand that so we can make learning uh, fruitful for all? And I, I, um, Christine, you had talked to me a little bit about some of the ELL trends, uh, English as a second language, <laughs> for those of you that uh, aren't into that in our own schools here. And do, do you remember any of the stats? That yeah, I mean, uh, the, the largest growing category of student across the United States are English learners. Um, by 2025, across the United States alone, 25% of our children in pre-K-12 schools will be English learners. Um, you can let that sink in. In, in. in California, it's already at 25%. Texas is close to that. Florida is close to that. But um, we, have, we, as an education community, are learning to celebrate that growth. Because what we see emerging is that being bicultural or multicultural, as we were talking up there in the green room mm -hmm. about, is, is actually very attractive to employers. And we're talking more and more about how we immerse children in language, whether their native language is English and they want to learn Mandarin, or whether their native language is Spanish and they want to learn English and Mandarin, whatever the mix might be, how we um, drive the whole construct of a bilingual, bicultural world, I think it's gonna be an important trend for all of us in the world community, which if you're, you're here, you're a part of that world community. And, um, and it is growing, it's incredibly important. And um, there's an organization called the National Association of Bilingual Educators that's driving a lot of really robust and exciting work. I know ASCD would know who they are. And, um, and they've, they've launched a brand new simple campaign that I wish um, the businesses and the schools around Columbus would support too. It's called My Name, My Identity, A Celebration of Self. And um, it has one simple goal, and it might make you laugh, but the goal is for every teacher to sign a pledge that says, I will pronounce the name of every child in my classroom correctly. All right, I'm seeing the educators around the room shake their heads. This is so important 
for these children coming to us from different parts of the world to feel respected and to celebrate their heritage. Um, McGraw-Hill is supporting this campaign wholeheartedly. We're pushing it. Um, that tweeter in the second row here is tweeting about my name, my identity all the time because we're trying so hard to get our communities to understand the importance of this work. Um, and I think it ties so deeply to the mission of the council and the work that you're doing, Patrick, around creating global citizens. You know, I, I, one of my um, best um, learning lessons as the assistant secretary was when I got to travel to schools who, who were doing this really, really well. Um, and I'm talking about the schools that just said, oh, kids, you have an ELL class mm -hmm. over here, and then you come in your class, and you expect to assimilate and just be as white as everybody else kind of thing, <laughs> right? And I mean, I've walked into schools where sometimes it doesn't take a lot of money. It takes a lot of thought about the culture and climate of that school. And so I'd walk into schools where every flag of every nation that was represented by that student population was there, right? Mm -hmm. They had international um, festivals and they would celebrate and they would be sure that all of the literature in that school was representative of the mm -hmm. diversity of cultures represented in that school. So there are a lot, it's just these thoughtful decisions you have to make about what's important to your kids because what you offer to your kids tells them what it is that you value. And if you value and view ELL kids as a, um, as a strength of your school as opposed to, oh, now I gotta figure out and get one more teacher and you know, mm -hmm. how many hours do I give to kids in ELL, um, it, it just makes a significant difference. So I just get so jazzed by people who do that mm -hmm. and look at the culture of celebrating it. And they'll be sure that in December they celebrate all the holidays. It's not just a focus on one. <laughs> and I, I think, and I'm gonna try hard not to be political here, but I think in the climate in our country right now, I'm afraid if we do not celebrate those cultures of people because people may look differently from us. Right. Um, and we make broad generalizations. And we hear all the time from teachers and principals about kids coming home or going home and what are they gonna do because the kids will go home and say, you know, if this happens, I'm gonna get um, deported. What a terrible country we live in if kids are living in fear because they're different. So I think it just speaks to this whole global experience even more and how we deal with kids in our schools and wow. families. Great, thank you. By the way, don't, don't forget you can ask questions. We've got a lot through Twitter that are now handwritten to me, uh, but also you can <laughs> handwrite it without tweeting it too. Um, and we could tweet it later, whatever, whatever you want. But here's, here's one I'd, um, I'd throw out from the audience. This is from uh, at Cat Prince, who I think I know uh, who this is. How might broadening our understanding of outcomes beyond separate subject areas open possibilities for creativity for meaningful education. How might broadening our understanding of outcomes beyond separate subjects, subject areas, open possibilities for creating meaningful education? Anyone wanna jump in on that? And so, yeah, so please join me on my one person bandwagon because it speaks to what I'm all about in redefining student success. I think you really need to decide within the context of a school, a district, and then a community, how do you define success for your schools, right, or your students. I would propose that every single high school have a grad at grad statement. What do you want your graduates to look like, sound like, feel like when they graduate? It's a grad at graduation statement, right? And then you back off of that to say, this is not just about academic achievement, that this is also about what kind of citizens we want to produce, what kind of um, opportunities we provide to our kids. And that totally opens the door that if creativity is really important, innovation, collaboration, that the system together figures out that how do you account for that? What kind of experiences do you provide for kids? And now with the passage of ESSA, um, just on a little bit of a bandwagon here, Wait, there is help, an Help us with ESSA for those of okay, us who I'm aren't sorry. deep in So it. ESSA is Every Student Succeeds Act. It's the legislation that was passed as a follow-up to the pre prior um, at ESEA, I'm gonna blank on those words, but No Child no, Left Child Behind, Left the NCLB yeah. um, precursor from years ago. And now there's an opportunity for states to actually um, create another measure of accountability, and every state can add something different to that. So what we've been working with a multitude of states who are looking at student engagement, for example, at social emotional learning, at creativity, to figure out, um, how, even though it's hard, how do you measure that and how do you account for it within your accountability system? So there's a golden moment of opportunity here for districts to lead the way on what's important for that. So I'm sure in Granville, because of all your work in global engagement, that's important to you as opposed to pushing out, I'm just gonna have one more test score.
right? We're just going to figure out how kids are good at art or whatever. So it tells people what it is that you value and revisit that mission statement. If you have creativity in there and you have innovation, force uh, my colleagues, superintendents, force them to report out on it, what opportunities you're providing to kids. Good. I also think yeah. that, the, that the parent community, I mean, when I heard that question, I think a lot about it's a shift in language. And, you know, there's any of us who are parents or, or all of us who deal with parents as the stakeholder group, you know, they're measuring what we are telling them that we are measuring. And if we're sharing stories of success that are based on, you know, the different things that kids are focusing on in school or the different ways they're achieving creativity or thinking about communication collaboration, then they're going to believe yeah. that. Um, so I do think it's a language shift, and I think parent as, p parents as a community is super important. The only other thing I, I want to throw out there, just based a little bit on your last question about um, employers and what we're looking for, the one thing I'll, I'll just say that might be a little controversial, and I apologize to everyone who's spent tons of money on lots of advanced degrees, we, we actually look for not advanced degrees. Um, and again, there are lots of, and, and what I'm appealing to here is all of you educators who have lots of different kids in your classroom, um, some of who are going to be on research tracks and wanting to get advanced degrees and some who are not, and, and there are diff lots of different types of learning. And for us as a company, um, we probably hire about 500 to 1,000 people here in North America um, you know, we are, we are saying we want you to come on and do hands-on learning as part of your employment. We don't want you, again, coming to us with all the right answers, but we want the learning to happen, um, to happen with us. And so I just want the, the kids out there who are saying, oh, God, how much longer do I have to be in school? You know, learning is not just about school. Um, learning is in lots of different, uh, different environments. Good. Thank you. Uh, this comes from another tweet by Rob Evan, too. What's needed to take promising concepts like STEM, whole child, and experiential, and global ed to scale um, so that we can establish these as baselines? So think about the question of scale, which um, for sure I know we've <laughs> talked a lot about, and I'm sure McGraw-Hill and you all deal with. Um, it's, a, it's a tough question simply because <laughs> We have um, in our minds a construct of what school is. And, and that's what you were alluding to with the parent comment, I think, um, as well. Because um, a lot of parents will respond to a brand new school environment by saying, but I didn't go to school that way, and I'm OK. Yeah. So if I'm OK, right. mm -hmm. then I want my kid to be in a school like, like I had. But the world has changed. We have plenty of of um, citizens who are math phobic. If that's a news flash for you, um, talk to a few of them. Um, but I think, so I think part of the construct is redefining outcome, as Deb um, articulated. Think about it from a global perspective. Think about what we want our children to be. And then, um, and, and in many ways, we're asking for a lot more than we used to. It's not the same when we start talking about these broader concepts. So I think the only way to bring it to scale and why um, educational technology is so powerful is that we need to do a deeper dive on, on what is purposeful technology and most mastered through uh, an asynchronous opportunity for a child versus what should be going on in that classroom or in that experiential, uh, whether it's a, a virtual field trip or a real one, or an emergence in another culture through the types of opportunities that Kate's organization provides. So per define the purpose that can be done with the technology, because a lot of times that can be done faster, because we're asking to put more into that bucket than we ever have. And then we can start redefining the role of the teacher in the classroom so that they're really doing the bigger, critical thinking, project-based learning, rich problem task type of, of, of work and getting away from anything that, a lot of the things that resemble that old style school. Mm -hmm. 
I, th I think one of my answers on that would be totally very simplistic. Leadership matters, and it matters a whole lot. <laughs> um, I, I can't tell you the numbers of schools I've walked into across this country where in some of the most challenged populations and even in, in very affluent, high-achieving school districts, the leaders who had a vision, and they become like the, they get a Verizon team behind them, right? You know, the old Verizon commercials oh, yeah, where you yeah. have 150,000 yeah. people walking guy. behind you. Yeah, it, you know, <laughs> y you could have great vision, but if you're across the street and nobody's behind you, nothing's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. So every time I go into, you just know in five or ten minutes when you want a kid in the school, right? And I, I always used to laugh because I'd, I, I just have to give you a really quick example of this. I was in a, a very large school district, and they invited me to come in um, to see all the work they were doing on um, community and family engagement. They spent a lot of money on this. And I would always ask, you know, what, what am I going to see when I go to this school? And I was going to a high school, and they said, oh, we have a parent room set up. We have people coming in from the community, blah, 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 blah. You know, and I run up the steps of the school, and the very first thing I noticed was family hours, 3 to 4 p.m., I was like, whoa, what was it before? Nothing? You know, and they were meeting well, and, and it was at a high school. So at 2.30, I'm seeing, like, people walk out of the building. And I'm like, well, who are they coming to see? The custodian who's cleaning the building, right? I thought, what, are you crazy? But what this said to me is that that leader in that school district didn't have a clue. You know, set out this thing, like, let's make sure we engage people, but never said, what does that mean and what does it look mm -hmm. like? So, And I've seen incredible leaders who can lead in just the most dilapidated buildings, you know, teachers who were tired who just jazzed these people up. And, and they're following them like Pied Pipers because those kids are their kids and they embrace them in ways that are incredible. So I, I just can't relate, obviously I'm passionate about this, but I can't relate enough that leadership matters and it matters a whole lot. It doesn't matter the standards you have. It doesn't matter how many trips you're taking. It's that vision and that courage to say these are our kids and every moment with us is pressure and le precious, and let's make it the best time they have. So I, I can't, you can't scale anything without a, just a mediocre leader. Yep, good. We talked a little bit, you mentioned parents, and um, I think a lot about as a parent, the, the power of parents and the power of people outside of education to have influence on education, you know? And I think most educators that I talk to are doing fantastic work and care about students, and it's these other like crazy parents, you know, like, like I hope I'm not one of them, but <laughs> I know these parents, and I'm like, what are you saying? And <coughs> be quiet, because it, it does then influence educators, and a lot of it's around testing, and well, we don't want to be diverse, because that hurts the, the testing, and I'm like, that's what we want, because that's real life. But th the outside stakeholders um, is something that I think a lot about. Are, are there ways that people who are one step outside of education, parents, business, um, elected officials, what would you say to them um, that they should consider about education when they start uh, making their ideas about how it should be? We'll do speed round. We'll start with Kate, and it's got to be 10 seconds each. I mean, I, yeah, I, I could not agree more with what Deb is saying about, about passion and passionate leadership Five, in four. the community, in the school, and in the classroom then also Three. ignites the passion of the students. Right? It's language. It's passion and it's shifting the language. Nice. A, a total need for a very strategic and thoughtful engagement strategy of businesses and community partners and parents. I'm going to say something really radical. Profit in education drives innovation. Don't remove profit based from education. It actually has a purpose there and it can really, it, it's a c collective environment of philanthropy, government, and for-profit businesses that will really help innovation. And if you want to talk about innovation, I can show you some amazing things that McGraw-Hill is doing. Fantastic. That'll have to be okay. part B um, of this conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our distinguished panel.